Casley, thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> thank you for having me. Good to be here. The Art and Science of Connection, Why Social Health is the Missing Key to Living Longer, Healthier, and Happier. Must feel good to have this out in the wild now, your new book. It feels so good. It feels so good. How yeah. long were you writing this? So I first started the process four years ago and then went through, you know, getting an agent, writing the proposal, getting a book deal, and spent about a year and a half, two years writing, re rewriting, editing, <laughs> doing a lot of revisions and things like that. So yeah, it's very exciting and surreal to have it here. Yeah, I, <laughs> I published a book in 2021, so I know a bit about that. Yeah, and absolutely. and perhaps the hardest part was having to to cut things out <laughs> to get yeah. down to the word count. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely, and to feel like it's done. I I still don't feel like it's done. You know, I could keep writing and. Yeah, I was. Forever. I had a conversation with a friend the <laughs> other day who he's writing a book, and he was asking me for advice, and I was trying to like think back to my writing writing process. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure if this kind of resonates with your experience, but it was the periods of kind of deep, immense frustration that always led to something really good. <laughs> and in the moment, it kind of, I, you couldn't, I couldn't really uh, make sense of things, but mm -hmm. in the long run, when you got that 1000 foot view, it just all came together. <laughs> Yeah, a year into writing it, I pretty much scrapped most of it and rewrote the whole thing to completely restructure it. Um, and that was frustrating, but it was also the right move. So I agree, sometimes those pressure points lead you to a better spot. So in the title of your new book, it says, Why Social Health is the Missing Key to Living Longer, Healthier, and Happier. So perhaps we define that. What What is social health? So social health I define as the dimension of our overall health and well-being that comes from human connection. So typically the way that we talk about health, the sort of predominant narrative in our society today focuses on physical health and mental health, right? So thinking about how we can strengthen our bodies and how we can strengthen our minds. But there's so much research at this point showing that relationships are as much a part of our health, as much of a determinant of our longevity as having a healthy body and mind, that we need to elevate that other dimension, that social health dimension, and recognize that health is not just physical and mental, it's also social. And the World Health Organization has for many decades defined health as physical, mental, and social well-being. But we've really overlooked and kind of forgotten about that third dimension, that third aspect, that social piece. And I believe that that is the cause of a lot of suffering, right? There's a lot of worrisome trends about people feeling lonely or having fewer friends than they did in the past, not belonging to as many communities. And we need to begin recognizing that that relational part of our life is as much a determinant of our health as exercising, eating healthy foods, getting a good night's sleep, and really prioritizing it and structuring our lives around that. Is that feeling of loneliness, is that the kind of opposite of optimal social health? That's a great question. No, it's one piece. I love that you asked that. So Loneliness is the mismatch between how much connection you want and how much you're actually getting, right? So feeling lonely means you don't feel like you have those people who you can reach out to for support. But loneliness is just one sign of poor social health, right? So a lot of people don't feel lonely, and yet there are other ways that they could be more socially healthy. So for example, maybe you have really close friends and you spend time with your family, but at work, you don't feel really connected to your coworkers. Or in your community, you don't have kind of a group or a sense of affinity with the place where you live, right? There's other dimensions to being socially healthy than just the absence of loneliness in the same way that being physically healthy it's not just about not being obese right that's just one aspect you also need to get a 
quality sleep at night and eat nutritious foods and so on. So just like physical health is multidimensional, our social health is as well. And so loneliness can be one indication that something's off, but there are other signs of it as well. Social health might be a new term for many of the the listeners, but maybe they've heard of social determinants of health. How are those two things different from one another? Yes. So social determinants of health is this term commonly used in public health and healthcare that's talking about the environmental influences on our health. So for example, access to housing and education and access to food in your community, access to healthcare, things like those Things like that in our culture, uh, in the environment around you, the context where you live that are influencing your health. So it's social determinants, meaning contextual, versus social health, which is really about the relational component. And so social health could be considered one kind of social determinant, but it's so much more important than that. And when we get into some of the data, it's, it's really remarkable how vital a role it is that we have meaningful connection and so we need to elevate that that aspect of it at what point did you decide that you wanted to dedicate your career (laughs) to this to to kind of better understanding social health and then helping educate the world about it yeah so i came across this term when i was doing research over 10 years ago back in 2013 i was um i had a grant from stanford university to develop this app and this digital campaign taking research insights on human connection and making them practical and actionable for people to use in their everyday lives to help us all live uh, more meaningfully connected lives at that stage And as I was doing research, I came across this paper written in the early 1970s by a researcher named Robert D. Russell, and he was the first one to attempt to define social health. He noticed that the World Health Organization defines health as physical, mental, and social, and he said, well, what is that social piece? And I came across this paper, and it was such a light bulb moment for me. I mean, growing up, I took gym class in school, right? I learned a lot about how to be physically healthy growing up. In the media, looking around at news newspapers and what was going on and influencers were talking about, everyone was talking about mental health. But social health, I had never even heard of this. And as I went to find more information about it, I couldn't find much. I mean, there were some research papers, some stuff online, not a lot. And even today, fast forward over a decade, there's still not a Wikipedia page about social health. Is that because it's it's assumed that it's kind of uh, that mental health covers relationships and, and social health? I think that's a huge part of it. So typically when we talk about connection or loneliness, it's in the context of mental health. But in fact, it's so much more than that. So people who feel isolated or lonely have a higher risk of mortality, right? It's not just about mental health. It's not just about feeling connected makes you feel happy or improves your mood. This is literally changing the functioning of our bodies. It's reducing our risk for disease. It's improving our health outcomes. If we do have a diagnosis, it's helping us live longer. And so if connection gets lost in the conversation on mental health, we underappreciate how essential it is. Is that one of the things that you think most surprises people people about social health? Is that it's you, these connections, relationships that you have in your life have the ability to not only affect mood mm-hmm. and mental health, mm-hmm. but can can manifest as physical. Yeah. symptoms, physical disease as well. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's very surprising. I mean, to me, I'm still amazed at the research on longevity and connection, right? I mean, one of the seminal studies that looked at this back in the 70s followed about, I think it was around uh, 7,000 people for nine years. And they found that men who weren't didn't have a strong community and social ties were twice as likely to die in that time period. And women were almost three times as likely to die. And they were, that was regardless of their baseline health. That was regardless of the other health behaviors that they were doing. 
So if you're two or three times more likely to pass away in the next decade just because you lack meaningful connection, that's alarming. That's, that means we need to take this very, very seriously. What are the proposed mechanisms that might explain how, you know, let's say, for example, you have really meaningful connections in your life. Let's say that I don't. Why might I be at higher risk of developing some type of chronic disease like cardiovascular disease or some other non-communicable disease like that? What's the link between the connections in my life and that physical disease? So there are a few hypotheses around this that have data to support them. One of the leading kind of theories is this idea of stress buffering. So when we encounter a stressful life circumstance, whether that's a saber-toothed tiger, whether that's conflict with a coworker or conflict with a family member or a health diagnosis, whatever that might be, that triggers cortisol, that triggers inflammation. It triggers all these pathways in our body that weaken our immune system and make us more susceptible to disease in the long run, right? And so if you're chronically lonely, that's a stressor. That doesn't feel good. And so your body is in this constant state of almost stress mode that is weakening your immune system. And so that's why we see things like people who have weaker connections are more likely to develop heart disease or have a stroke or develop depression or develop dementia in the long run. The dementia statistics are shocking too. I think people who are lonely chronically have a 60% increased risk of dementia. Um, which is shocking. That, that one hits home. My dad had dementia and for he actually passed away at the end of last year. And the prior two years of his life, he didn't know who I was. He missed my wedding. He doesn't know I wrote this book. Um, so whatever we can be doing to reduce the likelihood of something like that happening to us, we should be doing. And connection is a pretty easy and fun way. Right. So buffering stress. Buffering stress is one of the leading theories. Yep. Um, There's also this practical aspect, which is, you know, if you have friends and family who tell you, oh, you need to go get your vaccine at this clinic down the street, or here, let me help you take your medications correctly and read the instructions with you and figure that out together. There's that practical element of, um, you know, just helping each other be healthy. Or even if you think about the kinds of people you surround yourself with, if your friends all exercise regularly and are marathon runners and are careful about the foods that they eat and things like that, that social norm around you is going to influence your behaviors and make it more likely that you engage in, in healthy behaviors. So there's that kind of practical element as well. On the stress component, I remember reading a, a study that's just popped into my mind now that was looking at areas of the brain that are kind of lit up or activated when you're of service to someone, like giving someone something versus receiving and the kind of reward areas of the the brain the first part of the study i think elucidated that that reward uh the degree to which it was activated persisted when you kept giving someone uh, a gift so on repeated exposure whereas when you were receiving something from someone else the degree to which it activated actually reduced over time with repeated exposure and these researchers um, believe, I believe that this is from their study, but also drawing on long-term observational studies, were able to identify that, as you say, high stress is associated with increased mortality. But in this one study, at least, they found that people who had a lot of stress in their life, but were of service to others, didn't have high mortality. And I always thought that was interesting. It's buffering against it. There's a lot of interesting neuroscience research on this too. So for example, um, people who spend extended periods of time isolated, they compare the brain scans of those people to ones who spend a long time not eating. So they're basically comparing hunger and loneliness and the same brain regions are activated. So it's a cue in our brain, right? When we're not getting the connection that we need, there's a signal that says, hey, you're missing something. Just like if you're hungry, your brain's gonna tell you, you gotta eat. 
your brain will tell you, you need to connect. You need that meaningful connection. But when perhaps not so good at reading that signal. So, <laughs> and it might be because if, if we're without food, for example, for you know, even just weeks, we could starve to death, right? Whereas isolation and that feeling of loneliness, it's not really going to kill someone in the short term. Not in the short term, yeah. So we don't seem, we don't seem as able or willing to act on that signal. Um, if we're comparing hunger to loneliness, would you agree with that? Yeah, I agree. And that's why I wrote this book, because we need to. <laughs> right, so we need to pay attention. <laughs> we absolutely need to be intentional and thoughtful about connection and about our social lives in the same way that we might be intentional and thoughtful about the foods that we eat or making sure you exercise a certain number of days each week, right? It's, it's essential. It's not just a nice to have. So what does good social health look like? Yeah, great question. So there are a few kind of qualities that go into being really socially healthy. One of them is starting with a good foundation with yourself, right? I think a lot of times we think about connection as with other people, but it's also important to connect with ourselves. And introverts in particular, which I count myself one of them. Me too. There you go. Okay, awesome. So we need some alone time, right, to recharge our battery our batteries to re-energize that's essential to being socially healthy for us and it is to everyone to some extent but in in varying degrees right so i need a higher amount of solitude than a very extroverted person who's energized by being around people all the time so this one aspect of being socially healthy is connecting with yourself building that relationship to yourself um, and using that as a foundation for your relationships with other people Another aspect of being socially healthy is the right amount and type of connection. So I mentioned being an introvert, right? So the amount and type of connection that I need and that feels fulfilling and nurturing to me is going to be very different from someone else who's extremely extroverted. And this is really important because it's easy to think that we need to aim for a certain number or a certain quantity of time that we spend with other people or a certain right number of the amount of friends we have. But actually, it's different for everyone. And it's okay to, to honor that and to explore that. The last aspect of being socially healthy that I'll highlight is about having really diverse ties. So, for example, if you have a romantic partner and you get all of your emotional needs met by that person and you rely on them for companionship, for shared experiences, for supporting you during tough times, and it's all on that one person, that's not going to go well. It's much better to have diverse people who you can connect with, having friends who you can call, having family, connecting with coworkers, neighbors, whoever it might be, groups that you belong to. One differentiation I make is between the connection we get in our one-on-one -on -one relationships and then the connection we get from being part of a community, right? Being Belonging to a group that we feel connected to. That's also part of being socially healthy. So having those different diverse kinds of people and groups that we can reach out to and share experiences with is really important too. Yeah, I remember reading that, the part in your book where I think you spoke about a Japanese study mm -hmm. that looked at the diversity mm -hmm. of relationships. And mm -hmm. if I recall correctly, you were trying to illustrate the importance of surrounding yourself with different people, but also kind of getting out of your comfort zone mm -hmm. and making an effort which is hard to do to be around people who have different beliefs or values or are from a different culture. Absolutely. Yes. So there's research showing that if you're friends with people who are very much like you, you know, same kind of background, same interests, same beliefs, that actually is not as beneficial for your health as having diverse ties. So meaning people of different ages, right? Intergenerational friendship, we don't talk nearly enough about, right? Having friends across generations who you can learn from their wisdom and share your own and share experiences, that's really valuable. People of different political beliefs, which is hard right now in the US, right? There's so much polarization. I know people who've stopped talking to their parents entirely because they disagree about political matters. Is it possible to 
have some relationships that we would describe as poor. Maybe there's been a relationship breakdown, Mm -hmm. family controversy that's unresolved, there's resentment, but then make up for that with other relationships, community, friendships, such that you can still have a good social health overall despite having some of those types of relationships. Yeah, I'm glad you bring this up because we all have relationships that are difficult, right? Whether it's a coworker who just ruffles your feather and you always have friction with, whether it's a family member who you constantly struggle to see eye to eye with, right? We all experience that. Um, And at the extreme end, really negative or toxic or abusive relationships are not good for us, right? And we all know that instinctively and the research supports it as well. It's it's not good for us to be with people who actually are detrimental to, to our mental health as much as our social health. Um, however, in some cases it's more subtle than that, right? You drop off your kids at school and you see other parents and you don't really get along with them, but you have to see them every day. So how do you then offset that with positive connection, kind of minimize the amount of interaction that you have to have that's negative or try to improve it and then offset that with with other relationships? And yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's what's so important about having different kinds of connections because if one relationship isn't going as well, that's okay because you have these other sources of support that you can draw from. I want to come back to this kind of framework of good social health being foundation with self, mm-hmm. right amount and, and type, which I believe in your book you kind of described as knowing your social health style. Your style, yes. So we'll go through that yeah. and then we might even come back to diverse relationships a little bit more. Mm -hmm. What about you personally? What does this look like? (laughs) What are the things that you, you know, you're, you're the author of this book. You've been studying this topic, social health. What, what do you pay attention to when it comes to meaningful connection? I love this question because as much as I study this professionally, I love experimenting with it in my personal life and doing all kinds. And I share some of the nutty things I've done in the book. Like my final semester as an undergraduate, I did an act of kindness every day for almost four months. And it was totally life-changing. It was a crazy thing to do. It was my final semester. I had so much work to do to find a job for after I graduated to study for exams, write papers and so on. And I was like, no, I am not going to bed every single day unless I've connected with another person. (laughs) What, What kind of things, what kind of acts of kindness? So they varied a lot from really simple things Um, you know, helping an older person cross the street, uh, writing a thank you card to the janitor in my building or to my mom, um, to bigger things as well, you know, volunteering a lot in my community. I spent a lot of time at the local retirement resident, getting to know older adults, um, volunteering at a local soup kitchen, you know, all kinds of things and and random fun things that would would come up. You know, I'd leave friendly sticky notes in the women's bathroom on campus or on day 50, I uh, or day 100, I stood outside of the library with one of my friends and we held up signs that said, feeling stressed about exams, have a free hug. And we hugged hundreds of fellow students. Um, There's something <laughs> almost like poetic about social health in that compared to say nutrition and exercise, mm-hmm. which are obviously critically important for someone's health, they are somewhat not entirely because you can lead by example, Mm -hmm. but they are somewhat more of a personal pursuit. Mm -hmm. Whereas what you're describing here in terms of acts of kindness, connecting with other people, seems to be very mutually beneficial. It's bi-directional, yes. Yeah, that's exactly right. I think this is a really good point. And I've actually been thinking about this more recently because in the book and in my work, I frame connection as, as a essential for our health. And that's the message I want to drive home. But that can almost err on the side of feeling like it's something you do just to your own benefit. And that's really, it's so much more than that, right? I mean, connection is also an action. It's not just something you receive. It's not just receiving love from other people. It's loving them. It's showing up for the people in your life. It's showing up for your community and serving others and a greater purpose. And in fact, one of the best ways to overcome loneliness if you are in a time 
uh, where a time of your life where you're feeling disconnected is to serve others and to get out of your own kind of thought patterns and turn your attention toward other people in service of them. The research shows that volunteering is such a powerful way to get out of that mental rut, to make new friends, to feel connected to your community through service to other people. Yeah, I've, I can't remember who I've heard say this, and I'm sure lots of people say it, but exactly what you just said there, that if you're fired from a job or you're going through a big breakup, volunteering can be a, a really good way to kind of spend your time. Which sounds counterintuitive because it's like, wait, I have to focus on yeah. myself and fix my right. own situation. Yeah, I've already, I've lost something. Mm -hmm. Why should I be kind of giving away more? Right. And in fact... We see that people feel less lonely, they feel more connected, they feel less stressed. There's even things like, there's a study I love where people had hugs every single day for two, I think it was two weeks, and they compared it to people who didn't have those hugs, and then they infected them with a cold virus. And people had fewer cold symptoms if they'd been hugging every single day. The they more get, hugs they, they had. Jose, <laughs> off camera here. And uh, we always hug. <laughs> I mean, isn't that remarkable though? So literally a hug a day keeps the doctor away. Like yeah. if you are hugging frequently, your immune system is stronger. It's remarkable. So, and you're benefiting that other person too, right? Connection is is two way. And that's one of the principles I write about in the book, which is it, it's bi-directional. It has to be mutual. It's everyone not just what you're getting out of it. Everyone who's listening right now, there's <laughs> someone nearby. I want you to, with their consent, <laughs> with, with their, their consent, consent <laughs> we need to stop what you're doing and go and hug someone. But it's such an easy thing, right? If you hug your romantic partner every day or your mom or your child, you're, you're benefiting each other. You're helping each other live healthier lives. And that's really the message is that Every single interaction we have with another person, when we go for lunch with a coworker or we sit down and have dinner with our family in the evening, those interactions have the potential to help everyone there live longer, healthier lives, reduce their risk of disease, extend their lifespan. I mean, that's that's remarkable. So every simple interaction. It's beautiful when you, you think about just the way you carry yourself, how how important or influential that can be on on others on others absolutely and on yourself yeah being open to it so i cut you off you were you were talking about the, <laughs> the 40 was it 40 random acts of kindness it was 108 100, i think 108. yeah it was uh, a lot <laughs> but you were you were kind of walking us through social health yeah in, in your life and what in that my life kind of looks like yeah so what i learned from that experience of being intentional every single day about i cannot go to sleep until i've connected meaningfully with another person was exactly what we've been talking about which is i realized how easy it had been to be caught up in my own to-do list and my own worries and the things that i had going on and not be attentive to all the opportunities for connection around me. And they are everywhere. When we start paying attention and opening our eyes and prioritizing social health, these opportunities to build meaningful relationships are absolutely everywhere. And by the end of that experiment, I felt more connected. I made more friends. I deepened my existing relationships, felt more connected to my community. But it also benefited my health in all these other ways. I had was so energized i was really motivated to cook healthy foods and exercise often and i achieved the highest gpa of any semester at university because i was so focused and just engaged with living it had all these secondary benefits that i didn't expect so what that experience taught me was that being socially healthy means prioritizing it in our day-to-day -day lives and being really thoughtful and intentional about it. And so for me, being socially healthy means every single day doing at least one small thing to connect with another person and making sure that it is, is a priority. And this is hard, right? Like sometimes we go through times where we're busy and um, it just feels infeasible. <laughs> right, I'm just thinking about, and friends in my life, probably people listening, thinking, you know, we have a dual income house. So both parents are, are working, you know, nine to five. There's getting kids to sport. They're trying to get fit their exercise in, their grocery shopping. Totally. All Pay their taxes, things. Do all and, the things. And so I think many people would say, I just don't have time 
beyond what I'm doing right now. And they kind of feel like they're always you know, running late, missing some sort of deadline, deadline you know, chasing, chasing, chasing. Um, is that is that is that because people are assuming that this is very um, time intensive? What you were saying earlier, it sounds like a key part of this for you was just appreciating that there are opportunities for social health everywhere. So would I be right in saying that, yes, generally most people are busy, but even within that busy lifestyle, there are opportunities if you're open to seeing them. Absolutely. Absolutely. So in a couple of ways, the first is that sometimes it's just as simple as being present wherever we are doing whatever we're doing. So yes, you're busy driving around your kids, doing all the things, but if you can sit down when you have dinner together and actually put your phone away and just be present and ask one question of each other and, and engage for a few minutes, that's going to show a benefit. And there are so many small things. I mean, I dedicate a whole chapter to this idea of the small steps that we can take that have a really big impact because thankfully the research shows that even the simple things that we do matter. So even a 10 minute phone call a couple times a week can measurably reduce how lonely people feel, right? Even something as simple as waving across the street to your neighbor and exchanging pleasantries or sending a simple text that says, I'm thinking of you and miss you. We see the benefits from even simple steps like that. Now, more broadly, I would love to move toward a society where we don't feel so busy that connection feels like another thing on our to-do list that we can't have time for, right? And so that's why a lot of my work also is partnering with governments and with the healthcare system and with schools and different sectors to think about how do we reimagine the culture that we've set up and change the context that we're all living in so that social health can more easily arise. Yeah, like a, a different way of living. How do we create the conditions for social health in our day-to-day -day life? And I imagine that, you know, I have to believe that it's it's probably easier if you build some of these habits earlier in, in life, which is is likely to be heavily influenced by modeling and the social health of your parents. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's a huge influence, right? If we see that our parents, you know, make time to have dinners with friends on the weekends or that they encourage us when we're growing up to have playdates with friends and things like that, that is super powerful. Also teachers, right? I work with schools and, and partner uh, with a lot of parent groups who are concerned about how do, we, how do we help our kids develop social health from a young age? And that's what we need to move toward, right? We, we teach phys ed class so that people learn to be physically healthy from a young age through exercise. Why are we not teaching social skills? We absolutely need to. And I write about some examples of this starting to happen, right? There are initiatives in the U.S., wonderful nonprofits who are starting to implement curricula to teach kids from a young age how to connect meaningfully, how to make a friend, right? How to be a good friend. We aren't taught these skills. It's just assumed that we're going to figure it out along the way. But there's a lot of value in the potential of teaching them and instilling that from a young age. Absolutely. What about the flip side? What does poor social health look like? Mm -hmm. You mentioned before, it's not just loneliness. Mm -hmm. So if, if, if someone's listening to this and is thinking, I'd like to do a bit of an audit, take inventory, find out where my social health is at, mm -hmm. what might be some signs or, or symptoms? Mm -hmm. you know, perhaps this person's not later in life, so they're not developing chronic disease or anything like that. Mm -hmm. They're in their... 20s, 30s, 40s, and just wanting to understand how well they're kind of faring in this aspect of their health. Sure. So I walk through this three-step method where I invite people to first think about their sources of social health. So who are the people and groups who you're connecting with on a regular basis and who matter to you? And that might that list might be very long or it might be short. And that's not necessarily a reflection of being socially healthy or not, right? It's about the quality more than it is about the quantity. But first kind of take stock of 
Who are the people in your life who matter to you? And one way that you can think about this is if you're planning a birthday party and you're thinking about your invitation list or you're planning a wedding, who are those people who you want to write down on that list to actually invite? Who do you actually care about spending time with? So thinking about who those people are and then thinking about the strength of those relationships, right? Do you actually engage with them as frequently as you would like? Do you feel like that connection is mutual and meaningful in a healthy way? And that's really important. It has to be mutual. We talked about it going in both directions and it needs to be meaningful, right? It's not just casual chit chat, although there are benefits to that, but making sure that we have those relationships that go deeper. And then I talk about what are the the strategies we can take to actually act on our social health and become more socially healthy. But what I really want to drive home to people is that quality is much more important than quantity. So you can have a small number of people and feel super connected and happy, or you can be surrounded by a lot of people and interacting all the time and yet feel disconnected. Is there a difference between hanging out with your friends Let's say you're having a game night, mm-hmm. sharing lots of laughs, yeah. awesome time, yeah. and what's required to build deep relationships. Is, is deep relationships dependent on some type of exchange of feelings? It's a good question. There's a lot of value in having those game nights and just hanging Talking out, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what we're doing after this recording, right? <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> um, there's definitely value in that. And what we see in the data is that one of the best ways to build friendships over time is continually hanging out, right? Continually having shared experiences because through that you're getting to know each other, you're building trust and so on. Um, Within each of us is an innate desire and need to feel seen and heard and understood and accepted and loved on a deeper level. And so... I also invite us to think about it's awesome to have fun and to be hanging out with friends a lot, but is there at least one person in your life who you could share anything with and know that they're going to be receptive to that and have your back, right? That, that true level of understanding. And that's, that's harder, right? That, that takes more time. How many people in your life can you actually be yourself around? Exactly. Who can you be completely unfiltered, the good, the bad, all of it, the messy, the wonderful, and know that they're going to love you no matter what, that unconditional love, acceptance, absolutely. And I think that that's a source of a lot of people not feeling socially healthy because maybe they spend time with people all the time, but they're not feeling like it's going to that that deeper level. So if we're thinking about being a good friend so that the other side of that equation and you spoke to this is just being able to see someone and understand not necessarily needing to kind of fix all of their problems Mm -hmm. but uh sounds like listening is a pretty important skill here in relationship building absolutely listening and inviting the opportunity for that deeper connection Quite a few years ago, I hosted this intergenerational event where we brought together 15 older adults and 15 kind of millennials or Gen Z, and we paired them up and we guided them through this experience to have deeper conversations. And at the end, we were all sitting around in a circle reflecting on the experience. And by the way, some of them are still friends to this day. I mean, this was one event we did for a couple hours six years ago, and some of those friendships have continued to flourish. But I'll never forget that this one person said, and he was on the younger end of the age spectrum, I think he was a millennial, he said, I didn't even think to ask questions like this with my own friends. Like, I don't know why I'm not having more conversations like this that go beyond the surface level. It Sometimes it doesn't even occur to us that we can. So it's just a lack of awareness. Yeah. And, and perhaps not knowing how it's going to be received, you know, but I think a lot of us crave that, crave going that deeper level and, and are more receptive to it than we think. Yeah. Not knowing how it's going to be received. I guess another way of describing that is fear Mm -hmm. of judgment. Mm -hmm. So I can imagine intellectually (laughs) a lot of people listening, Mm -hmm. myself included. Yeah understand what you're saying 
but then there's some type of block or fear or something that is preventing them from having a kind of deeper, more meaningful relationship with people in their life because they're scared of exchanging feelings. How does someone kind of get over that hurdle? Well, first of all, that's very valid, right? And that that ties to how important connection is to us, that we're so scared of the possibility of rejection or an interaction not going well that we're timid about going that deeper level. What I would say is to start small, right? So, for example, there's great studies showing that when we do what's called self-disclosure, which is this term in psychology for just sharing something a little personal about ourselves, it doesn't have to be your deepest, darkest secrets. It could be uh, an aspiration you have that you don't normally talk about, but something that you care about pursuing in the future, right? Or it could be something that happened a long time ago that you still think about and that has influenced you in some way, positive or negative, right? Sharing something a little bit more personal, the research shows people like us more when we self-disclose and we like them more. So this magical thing happens when one person shares with and confides in another person where it engenders trust. Suddenly it brings us closer together and we actually like each other more, right? And if you think about it, we're also imperfect. That when someone says something to you that reveals, oh, they're not perfect either, it gives you permission to not be perfect too. You can connect over that. That's real, right? Yeah, it's like a weight off your shoulders. Absolutely. And that's authentic human existence. Like we are not perfect. And sharing in those struggles is so powerful. This is something I've had to learn. I mean, when I was in high school and my parents were going through a difficult divorce, I did not talk about it with a single friend. I just didn't talk about it. They knew my parents were getting divorced. I didn't talk about it. Me too. It. Really? Exactly the same. That's so interesting. Mm -hmm. it, I don't know what it was. Like some, I had great friends, but I just wasn't willing to open up about what I was actually going through. And what I think about now is how that actually limited me from having deeper friendships with those people. I was self-sabotaging in those relationships and missed out on an opportunity to go even deeper and to have more fulfilling friendships because I was afraid to, to share and open up. And so it's been a journey for me to figure this out too, right? I am not holier than thou. I wrote this book because I need to, to hear these lessons too. Is, is there any data looking at uh, sex differences with regards to social health are, mm -hmm. I guess the assumption might be that women have superior social health, uh, perhaps because they're better at sharing their feelings than, than men. That might be a stereotype yeah, um, and something that is kind of uh, explained or told to us by society mm -hmm. rather than, you know, genetic differences. Mm -hmm. um, is there, is there any kind of signal in the data that would suggest the sex difference here? There's some. Um, what's worrisome to me is that there's a, quite a bit of data suggesting that men are struggling with friendship more. So there's been a decline in friendship in general. So across men and women, there's been a decline in friendship. So we have fewer friends today than we did in previous generations. And we spend less time with the friends that we do have than in previous generations. So across the board, that's true. And I imagine but, there's a transition from time spent in person versus time spent online, remote. Yep, absolutely. And um, that's right. Although in general, even the number of friends we have, like the number of people who say they have no close friends has gone up. And the number of people that say they have 10 or more close friends has gone way down. I think it's gone down by 20% or something like that in recent decades. Um, but this seems to disproportionately be affecting men and men are struggling with friendship more. Um, so we, we need to do something about that. Why do you think that is, if you were to speculate? I think it could be what you mentioned. Um, I think that that could be a stereotype too. I think there is a tendency when we get older as we age where women in general tend to fall into these more social roles of you know connecting with other moms and um, being volunteering for things at the school for example for their kids or things like that there tends to be still some gender some roles, roles some gender roles around that where then 
the men aren't necessarily making new friends. They're not out in those same engagement opportunities. There could be something there. I think it's, I think it's complicated. Big picture, how has social health kind of changed over recent decades? Yeah. Well, part of why I think it's so urgent that we elevate and prioritize social health is because there are quite a few worrisome trends in society right now here in the U.S., but also in countries around the world. One of them is what we've mentioned a few times, which is loneliness, right? The U.S. Surgeon General issued an advisory last year declaring loneliness a public health issue, uh, uh, an epidemic. Um, in other countries, the UK and Japan appointed ministers for loneliness. Um, and there's so, there's some scary data on this, right? Something like 20% of adults worldwide feel lonely very often or uh, on a regular basis. Um, so that's a lot of people feeling disconnected. But there are other signs too. So for example, belonging to community groups, that's declined. We don't belong to churches or to local sports teams or book clubs as much as past generations did. There's also things like the friendship decline, which I mentioned, right? Where we have fewer friends and we spend less time with the friends that we do have. Um, so in these and other ways, you can start to see that these are signs of social health kind of in decline that we really need to pay attention to. How much of, of that do you feel is explained by technological ad advancements and just a, a change in the way that we're living? Um, because in decades gone by, when technology wasn't like it was today, people had to connect in person, whereas now... Uh, people are spending so much time online there's obviously connection occurring online but is that an illusion to to some extent is that is that an illusion and because we only have so many hours in a day mm -hmm. that's <laughs> eating away at community community groups that's eating away at going down and sitting down with your friend in the park and and talking to them yeah it's one of the factors it's not the only one <clears throat> I actually came out of researching for this book more worried than before about the role of social media and technology in general in our social health, which was surprising to me. I, I think I have a bit more of a pessimistic view about the role that smartphones and technology is playing in our lives now than I did before. Um, because just like you said, it's so easy to spend two hours scrolling on social media or in your news feeds rather than reaching out to another person in person or on the phone or some other way, right? It's very easy to do that. But that's just one that's just one driver. There are other kind of broader societal trends that are contributing to these these trends as well. So for example, more and more people live alone, right? It's much more the norm to have your own house or apartment and live independently. And that doesn't mean that you can't be socially healthy living alone. I've lived alone and loved it, right? Um, but it is a risk factor. And it does mean that if you are living alone, you need to be more intentional about making sure that you're connecting as, as much as is fulfilling for you. Another trend is, um, I, I think, honestly, work trends. The amount that we prioritize work. And I'm guilty of this too. I've moved to different cities numerous times for jobs away from my family. I live in a different country from them right now, right? Uh, it's so easy to prioritize work and your career ambitions and your passion over making sure that you're staying in touch with your friends. And I am super guilty of this, right? I'm so passionate about my work and sometimes I, I neglect some of my friendships and that's very easy to do. But that's kind of the society we live in where we place a lot of emphasis on that. So I think there, there are a lot of things going on where it feels like the pace of life is different. It's more common to move around, to live alone, to kind of value your own work um, rather than to be connecting in community. Yeah. My kind of core wheelhouse is nutrition. Yes. And when I think about changing food behaviors, mm -hmm. I think about it kind of through two different lenses. One is public health. Mm -hmm. Changing the food environment yes. would make a huge difference. Huge. Right. But that's going to be a slow process. It requires you know, 
changes um, at a government level, policy changes, you have to get private corporations on board. And so uh, in terms of helping people make healthier food choices, I spent a lot of time kind of explaining to people the environment is what it is. Mm -hmm. There's only so much of that you can control. Mm -hmm. And so you need to be more intentional mm -hmm. than say someone who lives in a different culture where their food environment is more conducive to healthy food choices. Mm -hmm. Is that kind of a similar story here? What you're saying is, look, the environment is kind of what it is. Mm -hmm. This is what we've built for ourselves with technology. And maybe there are a few things that we can do to control that, mm -hmm. but really you need to be super intentional with your social health because it's going to be very easy to let it slip. Mm -hmm. I love this question. You're speaking my language. I mean, I studied public health for this reason. There are two messages that I straddle in the book and in a lot of my work. One is that each of us should feel empowered to know that there are steps we can take in our day-to-day -day lives that will benefit our social health and that can truly move the needle and the social health of the people around us. So we should each, just like with nutrition, we can make decisions about what foods and educate ourselves and develop that skill, right, to eat healthily. In that same way, we can do that with strengthening our social muscles and becoming more socially healthy. At the same time, coming from a public health perspective, it's so vital for us collectively to also be thinking about how we change the environment. And so I do straddle these. And in later chapters, I talk about some of the innovations that are going on to, to change the world around us so that social health is a, a, an easier result of the environment in which we live. And we need to do both. It, we, we absolutely need to do both. And I'm optimistic because there are a lot of initiatives underway. So the World Health Organization last year launched a commission on social connection, a global commission to say this is a priority from a health perspective. We have federal initiatives policy that's being considered right now as we speak to support loneliness, you know, people who are experiencing chronic loneliness, and then also to promote connection among everyone, right? We have... Uh, an increase in doctors who are screening for isolation in, in doctor's appointments and prescribing connection as a form of medicine. We have more and more technology founders who are designing, who are either redesigning our existing tools, social media and otherwise, or building entirely new applications around meaningful connection rather than just attention. How do we design technology tools that support our relationships? We have teachers educating students about social health. We have so many, we have community builders who are rising up at the local level and bringing people together to bridge across differences. Everywhere I look in the work that I do, I see this movement happening underway to a more socially healthy future. And so there are the steps that we take individually and then collectively what we're working toward. And I'm, I'm excited about both. This episode is proudly brought to you by Inside Tracker. Track your blood biomarkers, understand your biological age, and receive personalized lifestyle tips backed by evidence to optimize your health. To get started with Inside Tracker today and get 20% off your first purchase, head to insidetracker.com forward slash Simon. That's insidetracker.com forward slash Simon for 20% off. I want to come to some of the individual um, things that people can think about in a moment. But before we do that, think about groups or um, the environment at large. There might be people listening who own a company and maybe they have 20, 30, 40 staff. Um, so there are people that could be quite influential mm -hmm. when it comes to affecting social health of a, a lot of individuals. What are some of the things that a, an organization, a business can do to kind of help promote social health for their staff? Yeah, I love this question. And a lot of employers are paying attention to this. So it's, it's, it's really interesting. I gave a talk in Silicon Valley uh, uh, last month where they asked me to speak about community building in the workplace and the value for the bottom line as well as for people's social health. 
And so there's a real business case to be made for investing in the social health of your employees. If you are in a leadership position, you run a company, having lonely employees takes a takes a toll. It costs employers something like over $4,000 per employee per year who feels disconnected in lost productivity, in lost retention, in dissatisfaction in the workplace. When we think about how much time we spend working, if that feels connected and we get along with our coworkers, or if that feels isolated, we work for ourselves and never see other people or don't get along with our coworkers, that's going to have a huge influence on our physical, mental, and social health and our ability to be productive. So there's truly a business case to be made for this. So some of the ways that employers can can address this is one, through setting the norms, right? And I profile a couple different examples in the book of companies that are going about this in very different ways, but setting that, modeling it from the top, right? So if you're in a leadership position, a really simple thing you can do is, um, schedule your emails to not send outside of work hours, right? So write the email whenever you want at 3 a.m., but schedule it to show up in that person's inbox during business hours so that you're supporting them unplugging, which will help them then be more present when they are in the workplace. Right, because if they see that email come into their inbox at 7 or 8 p.m., there's a bit of pressure there, maybe the feeling of I'm not doing enough. Absolutely. Or my boss is working in the evenings. Do I need to be doing that too? Mm, expectation. Right? Absolutely. So modeling it from from the get-go and then creating opportunities for more connection in the workplace. And there are simple things that that each of us can do as employees too, right? You don't even have to just be in a leadership position. So for example, scheduling, writing a reminder on your calendar every single Friday to send, spend literally two minutes and send a note of gratitude to one person you worked with that week who did something that was, that was great and that you appreciate, right? That's going to help deepen your relationships in, in the workplace. So there are these simple things that we can be doing, even without thinking about completely restructuring our offices to be more connective or thinking about, you know, um, work from home policies and there's all those kind of structural things but even just down to what can you do as a leader or as an employee it it can be simple too do you think um, that level of intention so writing a note saying you know do something on friday to be kind to a staff member or something do you think some people confuse that as being contrived could be right yeah totally here's the thing it is so easy to forget to do these things or to forget that they matter. And so if it requires writing a reminder to yourself so that you build that muscle and start to build it as a ritual into your life, it's gonna come more naturally. Sometimes it takes, just like exercising, right? When you first start exercising, if you haven't been for a while, you don't wanna go to the gym. You're like, oh God, this is gonna be painful. It's gonna be hard. But once you start getting into the rhythm of it and do it more and more, it becomes something you can't live without. You know, you you need to exercise to, to feel healthy. And in that same way, just, you know, writing it on your calendar or or being literal about it in that way can just help help us create that ritual. Right. You can shift it from having some resistance towards it, feeling some friction to yeah getting some joy out of it yeah Uh, it does have to be genuine though and i think that's also what you were getting at which is it it's it's not connection for connection's sake it's it's actually caring you want to do it (laughs) right right someone actually did something great and you want to acknowledge that and appreciate it it's what it needs to come from a sincere place Mm -hmm. but we can be you know more more systematic about doing it what if a company wants to ascertain kind of baseline level of social health in their organization. Mm -hmm. How lonely are my staff? How well connected are they to people outside of the organization, to each other? Are there tools or surveys or something that people can use? I imagine, you know, a lot of organizations I know are extremely objective. Mm -hmm. They're going to invest in something. They want to see how much has that intervention, Mm -hmm. funds they've invested in time, shifted the needle and led to some type of, productivity increase Mm -hmm. or um, objective kind of metric. Yeah. Is there a way that organizations can be 
objective here. Yeah. There's a validated survey, and I'm forgetting the name offhand, but there's a validated survey for connection in the workplace that that employers can use. And this is one of the ways that I partner with organizations, right? To think about how do we measure social health in your workplace, in your community, right? Whatever the context is, your school, how can we measure that and understand if the the programs that you're implementing and the steps you're taking are actually working and moving the needle. And so, yes, there are some some validated tools, um, but it also takes some customization and figuring out what's right in your context. Mm-hmm. We can put a link to that into the, the show notes for people. Let's come back to this framework of good social health, you know, having a foundation with yourself, the right amount type, and then diverse relationships. Mm-hmm. So if we begin with the the foundation with yourself how much of of that building that is dependent on alone time it depends for each person so i write about four different social health styles and the amount of time that you need alone is going to be different depending on which of those styles you are so these came out of my research and also the work that I do with communities where I was noticing trends in what does it mean to be really socially healthy and differences in people's approaches. And what I found is that introversion and extroversion is really just one dimension. There's also the type of connection that we like. So there's the amount of interaction, which captures introversion and extroversion. And then there's kind of the depth that we're comfortable with. So I talked about loving having those deeper conversations. And my friends know if we're hanging out for a couple hours over dinner, we're going to have a really heart to heart conversation. Some people are less comfortable with that. So I'm what I define as a firefly. So someone who likes less interaction, but going deeper in those interactions. Which is like bottom right? Yes. Yeah. In the quadrant. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, A wallflower, in contrast, is someone who also likes infrequent interaction. So doesn't need as much, needs more alone time, but they're more comfortable with more casual interaction, right? takes longer for them to build that trust or they're a little more shy and a little more reserved and that's okay. Can they still cultivate as much social health as- 100%. Even though they don't have the depth. Yes. Yeah. One, one is not better than the other, right? And and I'll get into in a second, it's still helpful to stretch beyond those. So it's, it can be helpful for, for a wallflower to go deeper and it can help be helpful for me to go more shallow and like, or, or to interact more, right? To increase the amount of interaction that I'm getting. The third style is around a butterfly. So again, this is more stereotypically what we think of as an extrovert. They like a lot of interaction, but also more kind of casual types of connection. So someone who's really good at engaging in a party and making chit chat with everyone and um, life of the party kind of thing. And then the last uh, style is an evergreen. So this is someone who likes a lot of interaction but really cares about going deeper and having more meaningful conversations. So they're an extrovert in terms of the quantity of interaction that they like. But, but they go deep. How do they, they have go, time for yeah. anything else? <laughs> so I talk, I know. So I write I about- I know a few of those, by yeah, the way. Yeah, I know some too. So I write about one in the book, Taylor, who is the best friend that I have ever met. And I don't mean my best friend, I wish. She's the best friend. Wow. Like she- interacts all the time. Her social calendar makes my jaw drop. It's too much for me. It would be too much for me, right? I'm a firefly. She's an evergreen. She needs way more interaction, but it's deep. She doesn't like talking to strangers. She doesn't want to go to a party where she doesn't know anyone. That lights up a wallflower that doesn't light her up. She likes going deep with the people who she's already close to. And so that's that's kind of an interesting nuance where you asked how, how they have time for that. She I mean, her, it's, it's remarkable. So one of the tips that I got inspired by her was this idea of go for connection first. So when I'm getting ready in the morning, brushing my teeth, making breakfast, putting on makeup, whatever, I love to put on a podcast. She doesn't put on a podcast when she's doing that. She calls a friend and she talks to a friend or a family member or someone she loves while she's doing the dishes or doing laundry or getting ready in the morning. So she goes for connection first. And to her, that's really fulfilling. And when I do it, by the way, I end up loving it too. Like sometimes I FaceTime my sister when I'm getting ready in the morning. And that actually feels surprisingly good. Does to it do ever feel instead. like hard work for you? 
To connect? Yeah. With the wrong person? To call, to SMS, mm. to check in, to carve out the time. Sometimes, yeah, totally. Again, I wrote this for myself as much as for for everyone else, for sure. It's 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 tricky sometimes. And some and that's okay too, right? Sometimes you need to prioritize your relationship with yourself. And one of the strategies I talk about is resting, right? So it can be socially healthy to take a break, to spend less time with other people and to reconnect with yourself or double down on a smaller number of relationships that are really important to you and let go of of other ones, right? That's really important. Was it the wallflower and the firefly? Mm -hmm. Those are the two social health styles that perhaps need more alone time. Exactly. Exactly. So the the neat thing about these four social health styles, or at least what I'm hearing from you, is that the degree to which you feel lonely Mm -hmm. will be affected by what your social health style is. So someone someone like Taylor Mm -hmm. might feel lonely still with what I would qualify as a ton of human connection, Mm. but it's just not enough for her because of her social health style. Or because it's not deep enough. It's not deep enough. So for her, she's she loves lots of socializing, but it has to be with close relationships. It's not fulfilling for her to chit chat at a party with someone she's never met b- before. Whereas a a butterfly might enjoy, might really enjoy that. Right. Loves that. Small loves talk. loves small talk. Yeah, that's that's fun and fulfilling. And so there's benefit to leaning into our style and embracing that and understanding it's okay if I need more alone time. That's that's great. It's okay if you want to socialize a lot and be around people all the time and work from a co-working space or a coffee shop so you can interact in small, meaningful ways to you. Um, but there's also value in stretching beyond it and pushing ourselves a little bit. Yeah, similar to exercise. Mm-hmm. Exactly. You, know, you have to, the term that's used is progressive overload. Right. You have to kind of push the body. Um, you know, you know your baseline, so everyone starts at a different point, mm-hmm. but you need to slowly overload whether that's with the weight that you're lifting or the distance you're running or the intensity that you're running to get the body to adapt in a a positive way Mm -hmm. so this should feel a little uncomfortable at times if you if you are in a position where you find yourself not being as socially healthy as you feel like you want to be then yes i encourage people to lean into that just like lifting heavier weights stretch you know working out your social muscles in that same way absolutely are there a a set or a few kind of quick questions someone could ask themselves Mm -hmm. right now that would help them know if they need to work on their social Mm -hmm. health yeah absolutely so it's comes down to the quantity and the quality of connection that you have do you feel like you have enough relationships in your life do you want more do you want fewer and do you feel like the depth of those is as meaningful as you want to be? So do you not just have the people available to you who you can call or who you can text or who you can schedule to hang out with, but also do they feel meaningful and mutual in, a, in an important way? In the book, you wrote about the 531 mm-hmm. guideline. Yes. <laughs> can you unpack that for us? Yes, for sure. So... We all are used to hearing things like walk 10,000 steps a day or get eight hours of sleep each night, right? And those are kind of guidelines that help anchor us or or serve as, as inspiration, right? It's not perfect for every person, right? I need to eat a different number of calories than you do, for example. Um, but the 531 guideline is really about saying, okay, if you don't know where to start, if you are thinking about your social health style, you're thinking about the amount and type of connection that's that's good for you, and you're just not really sure what to anchor on, start with 531. So the goal is to connect with five different people each week, to maintain at least three close relationships overall, and to spend one hour connecting each day. So again, What feels right to you could be higher and lower than that number, but that's a starting point based on the research inspired by data that looks at, you know, people who are meaningfully connected and thriving in life, how much interaction do they get? And that's kind of a a starting point based on that. You mentioned uh, wedding earlier in passing. Okay. And 
I was listening to a divorce lawyer <laughs> recently on a podcast and he said something that kind of stuck in my mind. He said, don't let the first time that you get everyone in your life that loves you together to celebrate you be your funeral. Yes. And it got me thinking, you know, I know people personally and I'm sure there are many people out there that really don't want to be in a big group situation where the focus is on them. Much rather be at someone else's birthday than at their own. Much rather be at someone else's wedding than their own. Does that just come back to social health style or is that something that people need to kind of work through and get over? It's a great question. It's so I have so many thoughts in response. One is that it's a shame that a wedding is the only excuse we can come up with to make everyone who loves us come together, right? We need to be more imaginative and think about other opportunities for that because it shouldn't depend on getting married that we are able to bring our loved ones together. <clears throat> My other thought is you just described me. <laughs> so I wanted to elope. I did not want to have a wedding at all. Next two of us. <laughs> I, I do was not. I asking the, uh, the question for a friend. <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm here talking to you, but I don't like being the center of attention. And it's not my comfort zone. I would much rather go to someone else's wedding. I really didn't want one. And, but it was very important to my husband. So after discussions, we decided to do a wedding and we kept it fairly small around 80 people. And I said, okay, if I'm, if I'm having a wedding and all my loved ones and all of your loved ones are coming together, you can bet I'm not just having a traditional wedding. Like we are going to engineer this around connection and community. And it's not just going to be about celebrating us. It's going to be about bringing our people together. And we had friends fly in from seven countries because all of our people are spread out, which is so frustrating. And they came together for a few days. People, we had four days of activities that we planned. And it was the best week of my life. And I did not, like we argued about it. I did not want a wedding. Well, and stretched. But I stretched. stretched I stretched my social <laughs> muscles. And it was so fulfilling. I mean, it was the most magical, remarkable experience to feel that love and support and community around me. And in retrospect, of course I would love a wedding because I'm all about connection. And that was literally just spending time with the people who matter most to me and helping them get to know each other too. So I invite us all to think about how we can stretch out of our comfort zones. You might like having a wedding more than you think. Um, if done thoughtfully, it doesn't have to be the same cliche wedding where you actually don't even talk to anyone because you just walk down the aisle and never get to have a conversation with anyone. It doesn't we can reimagine that like experience. That. It's beautiful. You can completely design it to be whatever you want it to be. And, um, and I have ideas for you if, if you want help okay. with that. It's very, I'll, it, it I'll can be fun. To <laughs> but also to your point, it shouldn't be a wedding or a funeral. That's are the only excuses we have to bring our people together. Is there any truth to this idea that you need to have a perfect relationship with yourself mm -hmm. in order to have healthy relationships with your spouse or children or extended family or friends. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I interviewed uh, this amazing thinker, Logan Uri, who wrote a book about dating and she leads um, a relationship science group at Hinge. And I interviewed her about exactly this because I said, I know it's important from the research to have a good relationship with yourself, but does it have to be perfect? And so what she's found in studying people in a dating context is that you don't need to wait until you're the perfect version of yourself before you enter a relationship. It can be an ongoing process where you are, are cultivating your relationship to yourself over time while also cultivating cultivating a relationship with another person. And that applies not just in a dating context, but in all of our all of our relationships with friends, with family, with other people, right? We're always works in progress. I'm constantly learning and making mistakes and changing, and you are too, and everyone is, right? And so we can be works in progress 
And let's be intentional about making sure that we are cultivating that relationship with ourselves and not just investing in relationships with other people. It's, it's, it's a balance. But there's no expectation for any of us to be perfect <laughs> before we, we enter a perfect friendship with someone. It's, that's not the way it works. Do you have any tips that could help us cultivate a better relationship with ourselves? Like where would someone start? Yeah. So one of, um, one of the techniques that's been powerful for me is self-compassion. So there's this wonderful researcher, Kristen Neff, who's written a lot about self-compassion. And this is just the practice of sitting down and giving the love that you would give to other people toward yourself, right? Accepting yourself fully and saying to yourself, I care about me. I care about you, Casley, and, and I want the best for you. This was inspired for me. I, I found myself watching old family footage when I was back home visiting my mom a couple years ago. And I found this video of um, Easter back in the 90s. And there was this little girl, you know, trotting along the house in a diaper, hunting for Easter eggs, like so cute and so vulnerable. And so, you know, didn't, doesn't know any of the things life's going to come at this kid. And the kid was me. It was me watching myself as a little child. And I felt so much love toward that little child. Like I wanted to protect it. I wanted the best for it. I wanted it to be happy and to have positive experiences to look forward to in life. And it struck me that it's so easy for me to feel that toward a younger version of myself, of this little vulnerable baby, but not to the adult version of myself. No, right? You could like, be extremely harsh to yourself. I'm so hard on myself, totally. And that's not healthy. That's not a healthy relationship with myself. And so the practice of self-compassion, and there are guided meditations around this and books on it and so on, is a way to have that tenderness that we feel for the child versions of ourselves as adults and, and to cultivate that healthy love for ourselves and respect for ourselves now, which then influences our relationships with other people. Because if I respect myself and care about myself, then I expect you to respect me and care about me. And I'm going to respect and care about you more easily too. Yeah. I had a previous guest, uh, Dr. Gemma Sharp on, and we were, we were talking about body dysmorphia actually, but it, that kind of inner critic camp. and one of the strategies that she kind of offered in that episode if i recall correctly was when you hear the inner critic mm -hmm. and you're kind of beating yourself up mm -hmm. you ask yourself is that is that something that you would say to a close friend of yours <laughs> is that how you would speak to a close friend yeah. and if not why are you treating yourself like that yeah i thought that was pretty powerful i love that i need that reminder all the time so work in progress, yeah. What do you think are the biggest barriers or challenges for people to kind of act on this information that we're talking about here and, and everything that's in your book? Mm -hmm. What's getting in the way or making this kind of difficult? Yeah. One of them is something we talked about, which is feeling busy and feeling like we don't have time. Um, another is our own limiting beliefs. And I see this a lot with people in particular who are really struggling to connect and who are, who are isolated or, or feeling lonely, where, first of all, people who are lonely tend to be more hypervigilant. So if you're feeling disconnected and then you go into a social interaction, you're more likely to be guarded, to uh, be interpreting everything the other person does in kind of a negative light, assuming that they don't like you, um, not, you know, not, not acting in a way that actually would help you connect more easily, right? And so there's this limiting belief and kind of downward spiral where we can get in our heads and get stuck in these negative thought patterns and assumptions and beliefs that actually inhibit us from having deeper connection. And so a lot of the research literature looking at what works to help people overcome loneliness when they're really experiencing it for a long time, one of the most effective methods is to work with a therapist to challenge those limiting beliefs and to overcome that way of thinking so that you can actually go into interactions with more confidence. And yeah, that's interesting because back to your comparison earlier to hunger, mm -hmm. both of these are signals. 
right? Something's not right. Right. And something that will affect survival, happiness, health. But again, with hunger, so if you get, let's say we get 100 people, Mm -hmm. we put them into a room, Mm -hmm. 50 of them are starving, the other 50 are Mm well-fed, and we bring in a buffet of food. We all know who's going to rush to that food. The 50 people with the signal of hunger, Mm -hmm. they're probably going to be first in line. But what I'm hearing from you is that if you take 100 people, 50 who are lonely, 50 who are have really good social health and put them into a room, mm-hmm. you might, it might be that the people who are already social are the ones that are interacting and engaging and the 50 that need it the most are doing the least engaging. That's exactly right. Which is counterproductive. It's counterproductive. It's counterintuitive. Yeah. So it becomes so important to pay attention to our own thinking about connection to, and it, it also ties back to building a healthy relationships with ourselves, you know, like having the confidence to go into an interaction, you know, optimistically (laughs) there, there was a great study that come out, came out recently where they paired up strangers for five minute conversations. The researchers did and they chatted, whatever, and then they took them apart and asked them independently, how much did you like that other person and how much do you think that they liked you? And then they compared the answers and they found that people significantly underestimate how much the other person liked them. Mm. And yet when they had a neutral observer who watched a recording of the interaction, that outside person could reliably tell if they liked each other or not. So it was clear to other people outside of the interaction, but not to the people in the interaction. So we underestimate how much people like us. And we're all going around doing that. We're all going around doing that, (laughs) right? So that's empowering information. Because it means that we instead should go in with a mindset of they're probably going to like me more than I think. And if I go in with that mindset, it's going to give me more confidence. I'm going to be able to engage more effectively anyway. Yeah, that's empowering. You're a dreamer. I'm sure you dream. I get that feeling. (laughs) What, What does a world look like where social health is thriving? It's one where... Social health is a priority in everything we do, where it's woven into the fabric of our society, into our policies, into our schools, into the technology that we design. We need to be thinking at that level. One of the areas of research that I focused on during my graduate work was on the built environment and how we can literally design places, communities, buildings to facilitate connection, to make it more likely that people will engage. So for example, having green spaces, having third places, which are gathering spaces in the community, like parks and coffee shops that are walkable in a neighborhood that's safe, right? There's design features that we can facilitate so that people are more socially healthy. So to me, a socially healthy future is one in which we're weaving these insights into everything that we're building and designing. And each of us is taking it upon ourselves and feeling empowered and having the agency to build connection as a muscle, just like we build our physical muscles and to cultivate the kinds of relationships and communities that feel feel meaningful to each of us. Kesley, this has been Extremely interesting. Thank you so much for shining light on a a very important topic. I said earlier, there's something poetic in in all of this, and I really think there is. Um, The art and science of connection, why social health is the missing key to living longer, healthier, and happier. Hopefully, all the listeners will get out there and get a copy. I'll put a link to that into the show notes. If people would like to connect with you online, is there somewhere that we can send them? Absolutely. You can connect with me on social media at Casley Killam. My website, casleykillam.com, has my newsletter. I send out up-to-date information, insights, research, and so on about social health on the regular. So check me out there. Thanks, Casley. Let's uh, let's go play a game or two. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> there you have it, friends. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did and want to stay up to date with future episodes, be sure to hit that subscribe button on YouTube and follow on Apple or Spotify. Finally, thank you for showing up and the effort that you're making to take control of your health. 
I look forward to hanging out with you again in the next episode.